When God had created heaven and earth, as we've heard, he then produced the state of Texas, and in it Houston, this rich place with its feet buried in the oil below and its hands now groping among the stars. What sort of a place should a space city be, I wonder? That is what we've come to find out. Behind the gate lies NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Where else but in Texas would men set up to administer space? If there were a tangible symbol of the American dream, I dare say this is it. The powerhouse of the new prodigies is the manned spacecraft center itself, the heartland of the $30 billion investment that is the monument to President Kennedy's commitment to put an American on the moon by 1971, the Apollo program. Men have made many temples of Apollo in their time, but none as big as this and none as costly. By now, this spacecraft center, all $30 billion worth of it, is part of the American tourist trail. So might it well be. It is, after all, their commitment, their investment. It's an investment that overtops the budget of many a whole country. But the moon doesn't come cheap. Once it was free, but not now. We have three major functions to fulfill at this center. The first of these is the selection and the training of all of the astronauts, and we'll cover this in a little more detail later in the afternoon. Secondly, we're responsible for the initial development and then the overall management of all manned spaceflight programs. And finally, we're responsible for the uh, dynamic mission control, and this will be the first area that we'll visit. On the floor, there are about 17 console positions. Of course, each area is divided according to its specific function. And basically, the entire back row here closest to the windows is all managerial. Now, on the extreme right, where you see the red telephone, this is our Department of Defense representative. He, of course, is the liaison between this center and the military, who are utilized for the entire recovery operation, because they already have the personnel, the equipment, ships and planes and what have you. And so they can economically affect a rapid recovery of the spacecraft and the astronauts. And somehow, as the science fantasies are patiently explained, the questions are always how big, how far, how much. Nobody ever asks why. Now, for most of our manned tests, we operate within a range of about 3 Gs to about 12 Gs, which again puts us within the limits that our astronauts experience during a normal Apollo mission. Now, if you notice, right at the shaft end of the arm, there's a television camera mounted at that location. And looking out the window and up on the wall, there's another television camera mounted that looks at the gondola from this angle. Now, the reason for this is that it allows our medical monitors to watch the facial, facial expressions of each of our test subjects and gain a little deeper insight into what they're actually experiencing at any given time. How very strange it is to find that already this extraordinary new business has moved into a sort of mythology, has created its own folklore. Could you believe that in this tiny space of time, less than 10 years, the technology of space travel has produced its own museum? Is it credible that today there should already be veteran spacecraft publicly displayed as interesting curiosities, the old crocs of empty space? and that among these ancient pioneers of only yesterday, there are empty showcases, even now, ready for the rocks and trophies to be brought back from the moon. In this space museum, I personally find it really hard to accept that these prodigies should so soon be embalmed in exhibition, like Lindbergh's aeroplane or Stevenson's rocket. And how strange that today that same word, rocket, is given substance by a scale model of Saturn V. How soon will this too be a curio, a relic, an interesting memento of these primitive groping days when even the moon seemed far away?
Here in Space City, the day begins as it does throughout America, where no one may be too young to forget the flag. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Marilyn mentioned NASA in her report. How many of you remember what she said NASA means? Ricky, what does NASA mean? National Aeronautics. Oh, All right, help him out a little bit, Roy, please. National Aeronautics Space Administration. Good. Only in Houston, perhaps, can children repeat a space catechism with its invocation of the new pantheon of saints. Are they doing the same thing in Russian schools today? I expect so. Um, Frank, Le Frank, and Frank Level, Jim Anders, and Bill, and Bill Level. Help him out, Amy, please. Bill Anders, Jim Level, and Frank Borman. Can you tell me what impressed you the most about this part? Meryl? Yes. Um, once, uh, on Christmas Eve, they, um, read the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible, and it was the most dramatic moment of the play. Thrust is okay. Roger, roll. Roger, roll. 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 Right on the old button. One thing we know, that the fuel that powers the vast engines of space, the driving force of the great phallic emblems of patriotic virility, is only partly chemical. The true motive power is conquest. This charting of the firmament is history's great contemporary joust where men are making holes in the sky in which to plant a flag. Is it smug to wince at pride? Rivalry has probably been the seed of most human endeavor. Perhaps this whole space business we're looking at is necessary for all man's self-examination. And perhaps it's not. So man escapes the playpen of the earth and lives his fragile hour swimming in emptiness before the cameras. That's a difference. We say these explorers are in line with Magellan and Columbus, but to the old adventurers, everything over the horizon was mystery. They didn't know their destination. They didn't even know if they had a destination. Now man at least knows the way and has the means. We say man, but do we really mean just man? Does it matter who is the first man on the moon? You bet it does. This is the beginning of January 1969, and the spacemen Borman, Lovell and Anders, fresh from the edge of the moon, are being given a parade in Houston. They have been given bigger ones elsewhere, and bigger ones are to come. But this is a traditional expression of the American scene, the hero's hometown welcome. Local astronauts make good. I dare say Drake was given something just like this when he got back from the high seas. Shorn of the astronaut's armor, and brought only too literally back to Earth, a spaceman moves back from legend into the folkways of his tribe, for it's part of the story that inside every lunar superman is an all-American boy. And so he is. America may be claiming this moon flight as a national conquest. In Houston, it's a Texan trial. No one indeed could grudge them that. It's as good as winning the World Series or the Olympic Games or a medal in Vietnam. They were brave men and their enormous journey had started here. Everyone knew how and how far and how much. Nobody to be sure asked why. This was no time for asking why. Governor Conley, Mayor Welch and distinguished guests, and all you fine Houstonians, thank you very much for this wonderful day. Of course, not everybody went to the parade. Some were like Jim Strong, a student at the University of Houston. Well, if you live in American culture, you've got the difficulty of having to get a space program funded, which means you have to sell it to the people, which means you have to sell it in terms of personalities, I guess. Personalities and an American conquest of the moon or an American conquest of... Uh, the solar system, um, 
I don't. Uh, that's not the way I relate to it. That's the way it's. That's the way it's packaged. As far as its purpose, uh, I guess uh, its purpose should be to uh, obtain scientific uh, knowledge, knowledge about physics, knowledge about uh, the origin of the uh, Earth, maybe the origin of the universe. Uh, it's like selling a product. They want to put the maximum in and get the maximum PR out of it. Uh, you know, if you're selling cornflakes, you want to you want to sell all the cornflakes you can, and, and you s you do the most effective thing to advertise it. So, you know, they have these people. They televise back uh, prayers from outer space, or uh, uh, people shaving in a, a space capsule, or something like that, which is uh, the actual hardcore data that comes out as far as scientific knowledge. You know, it's buried in some scientific journal, or maybe on the back page of some newspaper, and they they name craters after their little girls, and it's. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not. It's a facet of our culture. I'm sure it's very interesting and entertaining to a lot of people. But uh, as long as we can admit it and live with it, I, you know, maybe there's hope for changing it. I don't know. In this headquarters of mechanical mystery, there's a place enigmatically called the Real Time Computer Complex, which is inhabited by the real technocrats. The metal mines without which, it seems, there are no solutions. The computers, already now so intricate they can be understood only by their own kind. This is the dominion of the computers. This is software. In this curious world, the actual think tank is called the hardware because the stuff is made of steel. This is the software because it's made of people the special people who are the halfway stage between men and machines. Literally, actually so. They are the middlemen between the human requirements of this wild place and the boxes that give the answers. These people, you see, can ask the questions. They know the words, the symbols, the arcane jargon these things understand and to which they respond. These software here, they can translate what has to be done into the creepy conversation of the computer. When the day comes that they don't need software, they won't need anyone. What a piece of work is software. What an impertinence. But computers even now are not born, but made or at least brought somehow into the world, and by the very people who obediently assemble the things that will no doubt one day enslave them. How long before the electronics take over? Already they supervise our spacecraft, construct our cars, bake our bread, tabulate our taxes. How long before they determine our dreams? How long before they start demanding their rights with the first eerie crackling calls for computer power? Not long, I fear. Meanwhile, this hallowed hardware bides its time, growing and multiplying in its twittering, transistorized infallibility. There's an awful brainless certainty about these things that know everything and understand nothing, or not so far. These are the things that the astronauts find reassuring, all protective. To me, they are a sort of nightmare. If you can imagine anything more preposterous than me in an Apollo spacecraft, I can't. <laughs> the antics they make one get up to. It is like, it is like being enclosed in a sort of demented telephone box with two other men for probably a couple of weeks. Out of the question, I assure you. In front of me, or rather on top of me, is a bank of 
uncountable and equally incomprehensible switches and dials and compasses and indicators of one kind and another. I can't even read the language they're written in. Oh, yes, I can. There's the, the abort button of which they spoke so much. Then there's, oh, yes, there's the master alarm. I think I'd have my finger on that little titty for the entire run of the trip. <laughs> no. I don't think I have the makings of an astronaut. I always thought I hadn't, but now I'm absolutely certain. You'd need to be mothered by a computer and have an acrobat as a father. My respect for the men who ride in these things, my respect for their courage and their endurance is tremendous. I must say, nothing in the world would get me in one of these things operationally. Nothing in the world or out of the world either. I shall come back. I shall come back. I shall never be in another one of these things, ever.